thank you so much for that, Diana. Uh, that is a beautiful song, and it really ties in well with our message today about those that are coming behind us will find us faithful. And um, today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to be in two verses, one and two. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'll be reading from my NLT Bible this morning, but also I have printed at the bottom of your sermon notes today the uh, my NIV version, which is the one that I've memorized, so I use that as my memorization verses, but, uh, but we, I'm going to uh, read it out of the NLT. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, dis, excuse me, discarding, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor be God, beside God's throne. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Gracious Father, again, we thank you. We praise you for this opportunity we have here to be here in your holy house, in your sanctuary, your sacred sanctuary here in Seatonville. And now, Lord, as we worship you, we continue to worship you, and we continue to grow and learn. As we open your word today, we pray, Lord, you open our ears and our eyes. Lord, open our hearts to the truth that you had have for us today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I wanted to print both versions of this. I read the NLT version. I printed my uh, NIV version down there because I wanted to just discuss that a little bit and how, how, how things are a little bit different. And so this morning, as we go through Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2, it says here, who are the witnesses to your life of faith in Christ Jesus? Because the verse reads, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. And now in the NIV it says, therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And sometimes we get the thinking, well, there's a cloud of witnesses, it's, it's the... It's our parents, it's our grandparents, it's the people who have gone, up before, gone on before us, they're in the cloud of witnesses. And there might be some truth to that, that, you know, that they're up there cheering for us, you know, hoping that we are going to make the right decisions that they passed on to us and, and, and everything. But I think that the NLT really hits it pretty good because it says that since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, and it says here, witnesses to the life of faith. And so we have a challenge in front of us because we have many within our midst. If you're a grandparent or a great-grandparent, you have a family of witnesses, whether it's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that are observing you, that are watching you, that are seeing your life of faith. And of course, we all have a sphere of influence. We have many friends. We have different people that we know at different uh, stages of our life. You might, have, you might go to a specific hairdresser. You have a relationship with them. I, I've been getting my hair, haircut from the same lady for about 10 years now. And, um, and so she's a witness to my life a little bit. Um, you know, I work out at the Y with different, different people. And you just think about your life, you are a witness, and people, you're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, to your life of faith. And so there's a challenge for us. What do they see? What are they witnessing? Are they witnessing 
love and joy and peace? Are they witnessing gentleness and kindness? Are they witnessing some of that fruit of the Spirit that we talk about? Or are they seeing something the opposite? Are they seeing anger? Are they seeing gossip or greed? So it's these things, things to think about because we do have people in our sphere, whether it's our family, our children, grandchildren, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, friends, you know, people at the gym that I mentioned. And then it talks about what are some of the weights that slow you down from running the race of life. He goes on to say, this verse 1 is an amazing verse, by the way, because it continues on. It says here, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. And I want you, and in the NIV it says, let us throw everything that hinders. And so what, what, you ever, we were talking about the race, remember a couple of weeks ago it was the marathon. And if you ever watch a race, and I've been in a few of them myself, not in a marathon, but in like 10K races, you, 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 you don't go there with like leg weights on. You don't go there dressed, you go dressed in as light as possible. When you watch those marathon runners, I mean, they wear these skimpy little shorts and these skimpy little t-shirts. I mean, they're, they, they, they're as light as possible. Uh, that you don't see big socks on them or anything. They got these little socklets that you don't. I mean, they they it, 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 as least as possible. They're not going to be running with a fanny pack on or a backpack on or a water bottle in their hands. No, they're going to have as least. They're going to strip off everything that might hinder them from running that race. And I want to challenge us to think about and those um, that are watching on the internet as well. The thing about, well, what are some of the ways that might be hindering you? And I'm not going to talk about sin yet, because that's coming up next. But I'm talking about some other things. Are, are you kind of caught up in materialism? Are you caught up where you've got so many things happen in your life, such as maybe, okay, I'm a season ticket to the Chicago Bears. I have a boat um, parked out in, you know, at the Illinois River. You know, you know what I'm saying? You've got all these things in your life, and every one of those things requires your time and your energy and your, and maybe even some of your finances as well, and you, you've just encumbered your life with so much stuff, if you want to call it that, but you have so many things in your life that you really don't have a lot of time to really give your life to the Lord, to live your life fully, run that race for him, because you're, you're running your race on this earth and all the offerings that the earth has. And now, any one of those things is not wrong. It's not wrong if you were a Bears fan and you got season tickets. It's not wrong if you have a boat down at the, in Spring Valley here and you, you like to go on the Illinois River. But when those things become Oh, when they overcome your, your spiritual walk, when they became a priority more so than your relationship with God, then they become a weight that hinders you from running the race that the Lord has marked out for you. And so think about when you, some of the weights that are slowing you down from running the race of life. You know, I have on here possessions, materialism, sports, different hobbies. Again, any one of those things are not wrong in and of itself. But when they become so many things that you have, you know, you hear the expression uh, about kind of keeping it simple. And as, it, it, as, you know, I'm a baby boomer, and, you know, we all know I'm just turned 70. As we get older, you want to start paring things down a little bit. You want to kind of keep it simple. Because when you have so many things that you got to be uh, responsible for, it become it can become a weight. Really, you got you got just got too much on your plate to have to take care of. And as I as my body starts breaking down, I, I can't take care of the things. If I didn't have my son Don helping me out, I'd be I'd be in trouble, wouldn't I, Don? <laughs> but uh, and, and, you know, so things like that. You know, we think about what we have. And do they overcome our spiritual walk? And then finally, as he continues on, he says, what sin easily trips you up? 
Because especially, if he goes on to say, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Well, what are those sins? And I named a couple of them, anger and gossip. Of course, we can go on to like pornography, sexual immorality. I mean, you, you, you can just let your mind go wild because we know there are many different things. But what sin, what, what sin is in your life that kind of trips you up? That, that keeps you from being all that you can be in your relationship with God? And some of us struggle with different things. Yeah, I make no bones about it. I, I, I was at a wedding last night. You should have saw the food. It was hard not to overindulge in that food, I can tell you. And it was so nice because I had my other nephew sitting next to me, your cousin Matthew, and, and he was taking the meat off my plate, some of it, because there was a lot of food and it was good. But thank heavens I had, because I would have overstuffed myself. I, I, as it was, I already did. But you know, I struggle with the thought. You know, I was a sin of gluttony. You know, if I didn't have gluttony in my life, I'd, you'd see a 225 pound man in front of him instead of 250 pound man in front of him. But I struggle with that. And I admit it. But some of us struggle with different things, you know. Some of us struggle with gossip. Some of, some of us struggle with anger. Some of us struggle, you know, I was in Celebrate Recovery, you know, uh, Bill, the guy that, one guy that comes here every year, you know, he'll tell you, because he gave his testimony right here, he struggled with porn. He, he struggled with pornography. You know, you don't like to admit something like that, but it's a struggle. And he came to a, a recovery group and was able to fight and battle through that and gain victory through his relationship with Christ and through a great group like uh, Celebrate Recovery. But think about the sin because it trips us up. In fact, in the, in the, in the NLT, excuse me, in the NIV, it says, um, the sin that so easily entangles. And that's what does. That's what sin does. It entangles you. It, make, it can make a mess of your life. It can entangle you bad. I, and I'm not going to do it here. And I've, I've said this before, because I think I've maybe given a message on this verse before. At Oglesby Union, I thought I was going to use, I was preaching on this verse, and it was right after this quarterback for the Tennessee Titans, Steve McNair, he got entangled in sin, and he was killed in a hotel room by the girl he was sleeping with, who wasn't his wife. He had a wife and a family, and he was having an affair outside of marriage. He got entangled in sin, and the girl killed him. Of course, as I was demonstrating this back in my younger youth days, I was using, I had a football, and I, and I wanted to throw it to show, I wish he, he misses, he wished he wasn't entangled in sin so he could throw that football. And, and as I threw the football, it almost hit a lady in the back row at Oglesby Union Church. <laughs> Because when I practiced, I had my suit coat off, and I could have freedom to throw. But then when I was in the pulpit, I had my suit coat on, and it restrict, restricted my throw. And the lady, many of you know her, it's Vicki Scolari, who's in a wheelchair. She couldn't move. As that ball was going for her head, I was like, oh no. But it missed her. Thank the Lord. But that was a lesson. I don't throw footballs in church anymore. Just take your coat off. Yeah, there you go, Mike. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So then it goes on to say this. And again, this verse, verse 1, is an amazing verse because it talks about that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, that talks about stripping off every weight that weighs us down, especially the sin that easily trips us off or easily entangles us. And then it goes on to say, and it goes with what uh, Diana was saying, it says here, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And in my NIV version that you have printed right there, it says here, and says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And I want you to think about that. Do you know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? He has it marked out for you. So when you are following God's will, you will be running the race 
the one that He has marked out for you. And that's important. It's important that us as believers are really following the race that He has for us, that we're obedient to that. And I think that's one of the, you know, I talked about it before, we say the Our Father, and we're kind of like that, my will be done, not thy will be done. We, we, we come up with our plan, we come up with our race, we come up with our path, and then we ask God to bless it. But what I really encourage you to think about is going to the Lord with open arms and saying, Lord, thy will be done. The race that's marked out for me, help me to run that. Let me be obedient to that. You know best. You created me. You gave me different gifts. You gave me different talents. You know what I can do. And so it's important that we allow ourselves to be obedient to what God has for us. That we run the race with perseverance or with endurance that God has set before us. That he has marked out for us. So that I, I want you to really think about that. And then he goes on, the author of Hebrews, which is a debatable question, isn't it? Everybody kind of knows that I believe it was Barnabas that wrote it, but that's up for debate. Someday I'll debate some scholars on that about that. But anyway, as the author writes it, he says here, that not as we've had this race that's set before us, we're going to run with endurance, and then he goes on to say, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who initiates and perfects our faith. Now, many of you have that memorized in, in the NIV, which I have it memorized, that we are fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And I want you to think about that, having your eyes fixed on Jesus. I was at a conference, I was shared with you a little bit, I just made, kind of mentioned it lightly, that I was at a conference, and... Um, it was really, really good. I was at an evangelism conference at Wheaton College, and um, and it was it, it was at the Billy Graham Center. It was sponsored by the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, and it was a it was a conference on evangelism. Now they have these every year, but of course last year they didn't have it because of the pandemic, and so a lot of people there. There was about seven hundred pastors and ministry leaders from all around that were there. And um, it was really interesting. It was really good. And they keyed on something that a lot of the speakers were speaking. And they were talking, now they're talking to pastors, right? They're talking to ministry leaders. And, and here's what they came up with. They, they wanted us, and I'm going to read it for you. Because John 15 is very important. I, I don't know the last time you've maybe looked at this. You've heard it many times. Probably heard a lot of preachers preach about it. But in John 15 it says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified, by the message I have given you, remain in me. You know, the, I think maybe the King James says, abide in me. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me or abide in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. Wow. They were emphasizing that to us as leaders because our world is is in rough shape. The ministry world's in rough shape. We, we, there's, there's no fooling around that things are shrinking. But they were challenging the ministry leaders. They were challenging the pastors about being connected to the vine. To remain 
connected to God. And, I, and the reason I'm bringing this up, because the verse in Hebrew says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. And that's exactly what John 15 is all about. It's about remaining in Him, abiding in Him, keeping your eyes, keeping your life connected to that vine. And it's so interesting because as you read John 15, it says, then Jesus says, my father, the gardener, he cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. Can you imagine that? And, and I, I think about that because we all have maybe some trees or bushes or something in our yards. And if there's a dead branch, do you just leave, leave it there? You usually cut it off, don't you? That's exactly the picture here. So, if we're not producing fruit and we're dead, the Lord's going to just, that's it, you know, like you're, you're useless, really. And, but yet, it says here that the ones that do bear fruit, He's going to prune. And there's the challenge for us, is He pruning you? Is He helping you to, to be able to produce more fruit? And we need to produce more fruit. I need to produce more fruit. Each Christian needs to produce more fruit. And we, we have opportunities. We try to have some really good opportunities. And, and homecoming is one. Invite somebody to come. Maybe there's somebody that hasn't been here in a long time, and they're going to come back and realize, wow, I need to be back. I need to be back in fellowship with other believers. I need to be back in the Word of God. I need to get serious about my faith. I need to run with perseverance the race that God has marked out for me. And so think about that, just like when we had our fall banquet. And what an opportunity that was to invite somebody to come. Sadly, we didn't have that many that came because we didn't do, I don't think we did a very good job of inviting people. And we need to do better. We need to do better. And I was challenged this week by this, the speakers that were unbelievable at this conference. They were unbelievable, but they were challenging us on this about where are you in the vine? Are you connected to the vine? Are you abiding in God? Are you remaining faithful? And that's why that song that Diana sang was so important about remaining faithful because people behind us are going to reap the benefits of our faithfulness. If we bear fruit, that, mean, that means that if we're bearing fruit, that means somebody that is in our sphere of influence is meeting God himself, maybe getting saved. In a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. I, I think, are we singing Jesus Saves in a few minutes? Is that the song we're singing? I think we are. I better look. Yeah, I mean, we're going to sing that song, but you know what? How does that happen? There, there, there was a... Somebody, one of the speakers, and I had to jot it down in my notes, it said, you know, that we think that, you know, God's going to change, we're asking God to change the world, right? But the speaker said, no, God changes people. God changes people, and people change the world. And that's exactly, when you think about the apostles, Jesus came into their life, and they were changed. And they changed the world as they spread. Look at Paul. Jesus came into his life. A sinner, a persecutor of Christians. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And yet that man came to Christ and realized, realized what Jesus did for him. And he became this unbelievable missionary man, this unbelievable disciple for Christ that spread the good news all throughout the Roman Empire. The world was changed because
because of Jesus Christ and the people that he touched that were able to share. And so I want to encourage you to think about being abiding in the Lord and how we can be close to him, be close to the vine. And, and, and the author says this in, in, our, in our scripture today. It says here that we need to be, we need to do this by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. In other words, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then he goes on to say this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Boy, that's a weird statement, isn't it? The joy set before me, he endured the cross. That, that's rough. How do you have joy when you're going to endure the cross? And how are we going to have joy when we have to endure some very, very difficult hardships on this earth? But one of the ways that you want you to think about it, and it's so important, we need to have an eternal perspective. That this is temporary, that this life on earth is short. It's temporary. We live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world that is controlled by the evil one and the powers of darkness. And they, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to be able to run the race that He has marked out for us so we can endure it. We can endure and persevere in this world. And then He goes on to say, He endured the cross. He disregarded its shame. And Jesus is in the place of honor beside God's throne. Of course, the NIV says, for the joy set before me endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, a lot of us are going to endure some very difficult circumstances in our life. Sometimes it doesn't seem fair. We talked about, you know, Terry Foster. Everybody knows that his body's been racked with different ailments for many years and now he might be facing the biggest challenge of his life if he has to have a liver transplant. I mean, it's difficult. But I want to encourage Terry or anybody else that's going through difficulty, that's going through a tough time, that's going through challenges that seem unbearable, that you can still have joy when you think about what the Lord has for you because of what Jesus did for you because of his sacrifice on the cross, because he endured the cross, because he was willing to do that. And when you put your faith and trust in him, that you can have the assurance of everlasting life, that you can have just the, that knowledge, that knowing that when, when it all comes to an end on this earth, in this short mist of time that we have here, that you will be able to spend eternity and you might not be sitting at the right hand of the throne like Jesus is, but you're going to be sitting up there in a room that he prepared for you. And I think that's good news. And we need to get that word out. We need to get that word out. We need the Lord to continue to prune us so that we can bear more fruit, so that we can reach our world for Christ. And I want to encourage you today as you think about and meditate on these wonderful verses, as you take your sermon notes home and you see that verse in front of you about keeping, you know, that you are surrounded by witnesses. You're surrounded by people that are watching you. You're surrounded by people that look to you for strength, for truth. And sometimes it might not seem like it because, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're a, teenager and they you know they know the best right but continue being faithful continue being faithful because that time may come in that teenager's life when he's really going to need the strength of a faithful believer in his life and run don't let anything hinder you throw off those weights that maybe are hindering you and any sin that might be easily entangling you throw it off don't let it entangle you and run. Run with endurance. Run with perseverance the race that 
God himself has marked out for each one of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for today. We thank you for those that have gathered here this morning. We thank you for your word today that encourages us, that tells us, that instructs us to run with perseverance the race that you have marked out for us. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. It's so easy to be distracted in this world where there's so much coming at us from so many different avenues. So Lord, we just pray for that, that you would keep us almost like tunnel vision, that our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, help us to remain in you, to abide in you. Help us to be always connected to the vine. Lord, help us to be pruned. Allow the God to discipline us and to prune us, to show us a better way, to show us his way so that we can bear fruit in our dark world, so that we can bear fruit amongst our own families and our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers and the people we hang out with. So Father, we pray for that. Lord, we, we live in a broken world. So help us to remain strong, help us to fight the good fight and continue to run the race all the way to the finish line. So we praise you today and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.